All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA exam practice series. This is exam number six, and we're going to the next questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please subscribe on YouTube. Check out BehaviorAnalystStudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack and practice exams. We now have our digital versions of our exams available as well. So we will be sending those out shortly when you purchase the exam package or just the combo pack, you will get access to those. As always, when you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard, let's get going. 128, Kennedy wants to appear charismatic when he delivers a speech next weekend. To prepare, he watches videos of charismatic speakers impressing and persuading large crowds. Kennedy copies the hand and body movements of the speakers to the best of his ability. The behaviors of Kennedy and the speakers possess what? So what are we looking at? What is the question asking about? The question is asking about the different behaviors of Kennedy and the speakers, meaning something is alike about Kennedy, his behaviors, and the speaker behaviors. And so start to think about imitation and modeling and formal similarity and functional similarity. And so what is Kennedy doing? Well, he's trying to appear charismatic. So he's watching videos of speakers impressing and persuading large crowds, and he's copying hand and body movements. Now, why, by copying the hand and body movements, is this going to guarantee Kennedy is charismatic? Well, no, because Kennedy's just watching a video imitating what he sees. There's no guarantee it's going to work like that. There's no way of proving it based on the information that Kennedy is going to be charismatic. But what do we know? Well, we do know Kennedy's behavior looks like the speaker's behavior because he's copying what the speakers are doing. So what can we say about Kennedy and the speaker's behavior? Well, A, formal similarity, is how we can describe it. The behaviors of Kennedy, by copying the speakers, now have formal similarity. Remember the difference between function and form. Form is how something looks, the topography. Function is why it's occurring or the effect on the environment. We know for sure Kennedy, at least, is having some sort of form of similarity with the speaker. Can we say it has the same effect on the environment? Well, no. We're not sure if it worked yet. We don't know if Kennedy became charismatic. We don't have that information. So we can't say it has the same function or effect on the environment. What about a functional relationship? Well, a functional relationship implies that a manipulation of an independent variable affected a dependent variable. That's not really what we're doing here, right? We're not in an experiment. Kennedy's simply imitating. We're just talking about imitation. So don't make it more complex than what it is. It's just Kennedy imitating the speakers. And then what about reflexivity? Well, in reflexivity, let's just say we are talking stimulus equivalent. Stimulus equivalent says reflexivity is A equals A, right? Identical matching. Kennedy's not going to be identical to the speaker. Reflexivity would be the speaker video matches the speaker video. That would be A to A. So we don't have necessarily reflexivity if we are talking stimulus equivalence. What we can say for sure, though, is that there is formal similarity. In some aspects, at least, the topographies of the behaviors are similar. Remember, we're looking for the best answer here. So based on the information, formal similarity seems to fit best. 129, which of the following complete descriptions of behavior would be most acceptable to use in a treatment plan? When we talk about descriptions of behavior, you have to think along the lines of defining behavior and how we talk about behavior in applied behavior analysis. And when we talk about behavior and applied behavior analysis, we're typically talking antecedents and consequences as well. But we want to be we want to be sure of what we want to be sure we're objective, and we're talking observable stimuli and responses, right? We're not talking mentalisms. We're not talking events that we can't see because we want things we can see, we can measure, we can change, and we can be objective about. So be very careful when thinking about descriptions of behavior. So let's talk about these different descriptions and see which one is most acceptable to use in a treatment plan. So you need to pretend as if you are writing out this description of behavior in your treatment plan. Hey, Luann had a nightmare, so she screamed for her mom. What's the issue with this? Well, how do we measure Luann's nightmare? Can we see Luann's nightmare? Can we be objective about the nightmare? We can't. The only possible way we know if Luann had a nightmare is if she told us. 
Now, I'm not saying Luann's a liar, but that's an indirect statement, and we can never make decisions based on indirect assessments or statements. So A is out. B, Julian engages in hand-flapping behavior due to his autism diagnosis. Now, this is a major no-no. And what is the major no-no? We never attribute behavior to the disability because we can't change the disability. The disability is there. Since we can't change the disability, if you start attributing and saying the disability is causing things, well, you can't do anything about it because we can't change the disability. So B is definitely out. What about C? A dog growled at Brenda, so he sprinted home. Can you observe this? Yes, you can observe the dog growling. You can observe Brenda sprinting home. Can we measure this again and again? Yes, assuming we have growling dogs, we can easily manipulate this and contrive this and see it again. All these things are measurable and observable, and they can be objective. That dog is growling. Brenda sprinted home. C looks pretty good. D, Kara was bored in class, so she started to pass notes. Whenever you see things like bored and frustrated, angry, these are, are words you, you want to avoid. They're just subjective. They're hard to measure. They're not what we want to include in our descriptions. The best description here is a dog ride at Brenda, so we sprint at home. Just remember the, the basics. We want to be objective. We want to make sure things are measurable. You want to be clear, complete, complete, and concise. 130, which of the following measurement scenarios does not represent the dimensional quantity of repeatability? So our dimensional quantities are what we derive our measurements from. We have repeatability, temporal extent, and temporal locus. Measurement questions based on quantity, dimensional quantity, should be very, very simple, okay? Because repeatability is just going to be a count a frequency, a rate, temporal extent is going to be your duration, and temporal locus is going to be your inter-response time or your latency. And so these should be very straightforward. We're looking for repeatability, right? And we're looking for the scenario that does not represent repeatability. So all we have to do here is find the answer choice that doesn't have to do with the count, it doesn't have to do with the rate. So A, Logan eats four cookies that his wife baked last night. Is this repeatable? Yes, it's a count. Logan ate four cookies. This has to do with repeatability. B, Trisha is able to run 10 miles in an hour. What are we talking about here? Well, we have frequency over time. We have a rate, which is part of repeatability. What about C? Sandra takes five minutes to get out of bed in the morning. C could be duration, how long Sandra takes to get out of bed. It might be latency, depending on the SD. It's not repeatability. We're not counting. Right? We're not getting a rate. We're taking some sort of time duration measurement or some point in time. So C is not representative. Let's read all of our answer choices. Marcel answered 15 math questions correctly in a row. Another count. Very simple. This is not a difficult question. Do not go into the exam thinking all 185 questions are going to be hard because they're not. You should have at least 100 questions that are no problem for you if you're prepared. Meaning, you have 85 left that could be challenging, but still, mo many of those aren't going to be the hardest questions you've ever seen. Don't overthink the easy ones. Take it as a gift, answer it, move on. Don't question yourself. Just trust your prep. 131, Pedro is running for office and creates a campaign slogan, vote for Pedro. His friend Napoleon helps hand out flyers and promote Pedro. After the polls closed and votes were counted, it turned out that 16 of the 80 voters did vote for Pedro. What percentage voted for Pedro? All right, percentage question. You need to know how to do percentages, how to do averages, how to do totals. Basic math, but it's something you need to know. So how are we going to find our percentage? Well, to find our percentage, we're going to take our data point, which is 60, divide it by the total possibilities or total number, and that's going to give us what? So let's divide 60 by 80 going to give us 0.75. To convert that to percentage, just multiply by 100. And we're going to get 75%. Again, very straightforward question. Averages, percentages, totals should not be difficult. Those should be free points. However, if you're not comfortable doing percentages and doing averages, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Nothing wrong with that at all, but you need to practice it. 
So understand, how did we get this 75%? Why did we divide 60 by 80 and multiply that by 100? What gives us that percentage? If you already know how to do that, great. That's going to be easy free points on the exam. But don't skimp over the basics. That's where people get in trouble. They focus on the more challenging things. They neglect the basics. And then when it's crunch time, we're in the exam, we're stressed, we're anxious. The simple things catch up to us. Don't neglect the simple things. 132, the dean of the College of Engineering was in a staff meeting listening to his employees argue over who an award should be granted to out of three different candidates. The dean of college was tired of the arguing, so he told the committee to compare the qualifications of the nominees blindly and choose that way. The dean of college is being what? What is the dean of the college doing? What is he being? All right. Let's examine. Don't jump straight to the answer choices. Let's examine the question. He's listening to employees argue over who should be given an award out of three different candidates. So who knows what they're saying, right? Or, well, one likes one candidate better than the other candidate, so on, so forth. The, the dean says, well, I'm, I'm tired of the arguing. Take the nominees and blindly compare the qualifications. So if you blindly compare the qualifications, what are you basing your decision on? Well, you're simply being objective and you're basing it on results. This is the realistic picture. I don't have any other information other than the qualifications. And that's what we want to do in ABA. We want to be realistic. We want to base our judgment on results and on objective outcomes in, in the environment. So what does that mean? What are we doing here? The dean of the college is being A, conceptually systematic. Well, conceptually systematic implies that we are being consistent with ABA principles and ideas. It's not necessarily an ABA question, right? He's not talking necessarily punishment, reinforcement, extinction. He's just saying compare blindly qualifications. What about B, technological? Technological says we're writing things that are repeatable and can be repeated by other practitioners. Again, not necessarily what the dean is doing here. So what about pragmatic? Is the dean of college being pragmatic? Well, he is. He's saying, let's make this simple. You compare the three nominees blindly, just their results. Pick the one with the best qualifications and results. That's being pragmatic. We're not clouding our judgment by subjectivity or opinion. It's objective as possible. That's what makes these questions challenging because pragmatic seems very similar to empiricism, right? Empiricism is much more rooted, though, in the observation, okay? Pragmatic is almost more result-driven and objective-driven. So it's hard to distinguish sometimes. You've got to be very careful in these questions, right? Read them very, very closely. In this case, the dean is being pragmatic. All right, compare blindly, choose the best one. What about deterministic? Well, determinism says our universe is lawful and orderly. Behavior happens for a reason. We're not really talking about behavior happening for a mentalistic reason or for no reason. It's not what we're necessarily discussing here. We're talking about the dean of college helping pick these candidates in a very pragmatic way. Tony starts as the new human resource manager at a group of veterinarian clinics in her city. Tony wants to establish a bonus structure for the employees, but first she wants to evaluate what each employee values most when they receive a reward. She sits down with each employee and talks with them for about 15 minutes. What best describes Tony's strategy is sitting down with each employee to find out what they value. So we're looking at Tony's strategy of doing what? Sitting down with each employee to see what they value, which is a great strategy because as the HR manager, she wants a bonus structure for the employees. But instead of just jumping in and saying, well, you all get one more day off or you get all get a $100 bonus, she says, I'm going to see what they actually value. And why is that important? Well, she's managing her personnel. And personnel management is just like client management. We would never just assume what our client wants or likes. We're going to go through preference assessments and direct assessments, so on and so forth. So Tony, by sitting down with each employee and talking with them, what type of assessment is she doing? A, a single choice preference assessment. With a single choice preference assessment, we're presenting one item at a, at a time and measuring engagement. Tony's not presenting one item at a time. She's having a conversation. So what about B, a free operant preference assessment? 
with the free operant preference assessment, we're watching the, the subject, the learner, the participant in their natural environment engaging with stimuli. Tony's not doing that. She's talking with them. What Tony's doing is basically an interview. She's using an indirect assessment to determine preference. Why is it not D, a functional analysis? Well, the functional analysis, we're manipulating antecedents and consequences to determine function in different conditions. Clearly, we're not doing that. She's doing some sort of preference assessment. In this case, a very indirect one. And so once Tony gets her list, maybe she'll do a more structured and systematic assessment. But for now, very indirect and simply an interview to find out what they value. And then 134, Lucy, like her older brothers and sisters, only buys Pepsi for her family and only orders Pepsi when she is at a restaurant. Growing up, Lucy was made a fun of if she drank Coke instead of Pepsi, so she eventually grew to enjoy Pepsi over Coke. Lucy's behavior could best be described as what? Now, what is Lucy's behavior? Well, this idea that she's buying Pepsi, right? She buys Pepsi for her family, Pepsi at restaurants. And why does she do that? Well, growing up, she was made fun of if she drank Coke, so looks like punishment, right? And so she just enjoyed Pepsi. So if punishment shaped Lucy's behavior, what is that considered? Now let's, that's a broad question, understandably. So it's operant conditioning clearly, okay? And so let's look at our first answer choice, phylogenic. So phylogeny has to do with genetics and evolution over a long, long period of time. Genetics is not the reason Lucy is liking the Pepsi. She likes it because she was punished for drinking Coke by being made fun of. So we're not dealing with genetic and evolutionary ideas here. We're dealing with autogeny. What is your learning history? Autogenic is learning history related. Lucy's learning history has shaped her enjoyment of Pepsi over Coke. Why is it not rule governed? Well, rule governed, the behavior is not contingency shaped. It's not dependent on actually meeting the contingency. Lucy's behavior in this case is she drank Coke instead of Pepsi. She was punished. So now she drinks Pepsi, avoiding the punishment, right? And so her behavior is contingency shaped, not rule governed. Lucy's behavior could best be described as ontogenic or based on learning history. Thank you for watching. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. The link is in the comments below. Subscribe if you have not already. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.